back to chapter five. In this chapter, we are starting to look at the standard deviation as a rule as a ruler and the normal model, or also known as the normal distribution. This chapter is going to involve like some actual formulas. Um, we're going to look at our first table. Um, it's going to be more math-like than a lot of the previous chapters, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing, but I think for a lot of you, that's that's going to be more of a good thing. Um, so let's take a look at what we're doing here, our learning targets. We're going to convert between values and z-scores. It's a quick formula, actually a super easy formula. Compare and interpret data using standardization, which is a fun word, standardization. Determine the effects of rescaling data. Use the 68959.97 rule to find probabilities and intervals of values. We actually saw this a little bit way back in Algebra 2. Um, use summary statistics, histograms, and normal probability plots to assess normality. One of my favorite phrases deals in statistics deals with that, and so we'll definitely get to that. So first we're going to start by standardizing with z-scores. Why would we want to standardize values? Well, there's a few reasons why we would want to standardize values. One is so that they're just easier to work with. We're going to have tables that require a standardized value as opposed to having tables for every possible value. Um, secondly, standardizing values are really super useful when it comes to comparing two different things. Uh, I know the book uses um, two different track and field events to see who did better. Well, it's hard to compare a long jump in a 400 meter relay. Um, we're going to look at two scores. You got a 1311 on your SAT. Not horrible, but you know, it's, it's, it's okay. And your friend got a 27 on the ACT. Well, how do you compare those two values? Well, I mean, obviously you took the SAT, you did way better than a 27, you got a 1311, but they're two very different types of scores. And so what we can do is we can standardize the values. The standardization, we take Z, which is called the Z-score, that's actually this, it's a Z-score. Um, it's the value y minus y hat, the average, divided by s, the standard deviation. And what this does, the y minus the y hat subtracting the mean moves the mean to zero. Anything less than the mean is going to be negative. Anything bigger than the mean is going to be positive. So we just shift the mean to zero. It would be like subtracting points away from a test to make it so the average is zero um, or adding points. It doesn't change what the distribution looks like at all. And then by dividing by the standard deviation, it changes it so the standard deviation becomes one. So the Z score, the standardized values is going to be a distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. We'll get to that more in just a minute. Um, but what this does, it gives us a value that tells how many standard deviations away from the mean our numbers are. So in working with these, we need some extra data. So luckily, I thought this through and I went on, I looked up the 2019 um, scores for the SAT and the ACT. The SAT had a mean score in 2019 of 1059 and a standard deviation of 210. The ACT had a mean score of 20.8 and a standard deviation of 5.8. Well, so who did better? I mean, you're, they're both above average. Well, we're going to figure out the Z-score. So for this, we're just going to go, the SAT Z is going to be the 1311 minus the mean, 1059, divided by the standard deviation of 210. We can subtract those two values, divide by 210, 
to get z is 1.2. So you scored 1.2 standard deviations above the mean. Your friend on the ACT, their z-score is going to be 27 minus 20.8 divided by 5.8. Run those calculations and you're going to get a 1.0689, so 1.07. So they scored 1.07 standard deviations above the mean. So on your respective test, you scored better than they scored. Um, and so that's that's how we can use standard standardized values to compare. We're going to use these a lot. Um, in fact, this standardization um, with sometimes small little tweaks to it is kind of like the solving equations topic in algebra where it just keeps going over and over throughout all the topics. It's just this little equation. We have z equals just y minus y bar or x minus x bar divided by the standard deviation. Um, we'll actually see a variation of it in just a minute, but um, that's what it is. And notice I did not show my calculations on this because you're gonna be using a calculator. I mean, honestly, if, if you're not using the calculator to find it for you in the first place, you're gonna be using a calculator to do the calculations. Um, that's expected. and and so you don't have to show the calculations. In fact, the work that we show in statistics, when we have to show our work, it's not the same as it is in other places. Generally speaking, the z-score is not going to be our final answer. In fact, even in this situation, the z-score wasn't our final answer. The z-score itself was the work. The final answer is, I scored 1.2 standard deviations higher than the mean on my test, so I did better than my friend who only scored 1.07 standard deviations above the mean on his test. Like, that's the answer. Notice it's in context. I mean, I don't actually have the, the question written down, but that's what we're talking about. So with the answer, you can see what the question was. That is the answer. These z equals this, z equals this, that's the work. Setting it up in the equations here is nice, but not particularly necessary. Like we could have gone, all right, so here's the question, z equals 1.2, z equals 1.07, so I scored higher on my test than my friend did. Like that would be what a statistics problem could look like. Um, and so, when we were doing these things, as I mentioned earlier, when we subtracted the mean, that shifted the center. That moved it so that this distribution, which is hopefully symmetric and bell-shaped, we're gonna be looking at the normal distribution, it's that bell curve, um, but it shifts it so that the center is on zero, the mean is on zero, and then dividing by the standard deviation does a horizontal stretch or compression to make it so that that standard deviation is one. That way, every normal or every that's the standard standard normal curve, um, but they all look the same. And so, what does that actually look like? That looks like. Well, this hasn't come up yet. The normal model, um, also called the normal distribution. Um, I generally refer to it as the normal distribution. This book uses normal model mostly, but they also will put normal distribution, like they just prefer model. Model is a shorter word. Um, and the nice thing about model is that the model is not what actually happens. It's more of an idealized shape. That way we can avoid some of the little like bumps and and the bars of a histogram. It smooths it out and it just it makes it that ideal shape. And what that ideal shape is for a normal distribution is this. We can ignore the 90% and 10%. That was just part of the 
uh, picture here. Um, but this is what the normal curve looks like. It is that bell curve. It's unimodal. So there's only that one peak. It's symmetric. This one is the standard normal curve because it's centered at zero and has the standard deviations of one. A um, couple things about it. It's, a, it's what's called a density curve, which means that the total area underneath is one and the area underneath the specific section is the probability of that happening. So the area like in this 10% area, this area is actually going to be 0.1. And this other area over here is going to be 0.9. And so we'll be finding the area under the curve. Now, that might just be bringing back some PTSD from people from calculus thinking area under the curve. Oh no, calculus. No, no, we don't need to know calculus for this. One of the reasons why we make it standardized is that somebody else has found all those values for us and has put them in a table. We're going to see how to use the table uh, in just a few minutes. Um, but, and, and it's a good thing too, because if you saw the equation for this, it's, it's disgusting. I'll show you the equation later. I don't have it in this and I'd have to look it up. Like, I don't even know the equation off the top of my head. It's that gross. Um, but I will show it to you later just so that you can appreciate the table and the fact that we don't have to ever look at this equation at all, ever for any reason. Um, so where was I? Let's see, it's symmetric. The area underneath is one. The area underneath a certain part is a, um, is the probability. Uh, when we're drawing it, a, uh, a tip to drawing it is that at that one standard deviation each way, this point right here is the inflection point. All right, calculus just got a little bit sweats going again. The inflection point is just where it switches from curving down, like here it's curving down, to curving up. Here it has a upwards curve. So that's all that is. And so when you're drawing it, that just kind of helps. I mean, drawing it, it's a bit of an art form and it'll get better with practice. Um, but uh, that's what that looks like. So um, there's notation for the normal distribution. The notation, it's n and then mu sigma. Well, wait a second, mu and sigma, what are those? Mu, this guy right here is mu, and that's the mean. Hey, you're probably thinking, whoa, 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 hold your horses there. You told us the mean was x bar. Yes, x bar is the sample mean, mu, is the population mean. And then sigma, this is a lowercase sigma. The uppercase is that um, summation sign. So this is a lowercase sigma. It looks like a little circle with a ball cap. Um, this is the uh, population standard deviation, where s was the sample standard deviation. Um, and so you might be thinking like, well, wait, why do we use Greek letters for these? We use Greek letters for these for one reason. It's because who knows what that population mean and population standard deviation are? I don't know. You don't know what the population mean and standard deviation are. The population is going to be huge in most cases. So who would know? Zeus. Zeus would know. Zeus would use Greek letters. I use Zeus because I haven't found too many people who are um, who are uh, ancient Greek mythological orthodox, and so it generally is non-offensive. Um, so we have mu and sigma; those are the populations. So right here, the standard normal curve. is going to be n, 
with a mean 0 and a standard deviation 1. Now they won't always be that way. We'll see we'll see some other ones here in just a second where they haven't been standardized, um, but that's okay. Um, and then with this the z value, if we know those population values, we can find this z score. It's y minus mu over sigma. If we don't know the population values, then we go back to the sample values, and that's just kind of what we have to use. Um, but with the population values, those are the better ones to use. Um, and so we want to check to see if things are normal. And so to check to see if things are normal, because a lot of times we're looking for z-scores are either really, really, really big or really, really, really small. Um, and so, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, to check if things are normal, we're looking for nearly normal conditions. Oh, I had that written down. I didn't need to write it out. Oh, well, you got it twice. Um, so we're looking for nearly normal conditions because it's not going to be perfectly normal. First of all, even if the even if it was perfectly normal, we are not going to have enough data to make it perfectly normal. You would need an infinite amount of data for it to be a smooth normal curve. That's not going to happen. And so we're looking for nearly normal conditions. And the, here's where my favorite one of one of my favorite terms comes from. So we can't say that it's normal or not, but what we say is that it's not clearly non-normal. I mean, that's statistics at its finest. I mean, if that's not a definite statement that it's not clearly non-normal, oh, it's beautiful. So what are we looking for? We're looking for it to be symmetric. We're looking for it to be unimodal. We're looking for it to be roughly bell-shaped. It's higher in the center and it goes out on each end. Um, a lot of the histograms we've looked at when they've been symmetric, they've been not clearly non-normal. Like we'd be able to use a normal distribution on that. So things to look for, like, is it clearly skewed? We don't want to use it if it's clearly skewed. We will have other things that we can do with skewed stuff. Um, but if it's clearly skewed, if there's more than one mode, we don't want to try and make it a normal distribution. Um, if there's some big outliers, don't want to use a normal distribution because outliers affects the mean and standard deviation. And that's what this whole thing is built off of, is the mean and standard deviation. So things like that make it so that it's, would make it so we couldn't use a normal curve. But as long as it's not skewed a lot or with big outliers, um, then it's not clearly non-normal. So we can use a normal distribution. Look at that. It's fun. Um, so one of the things with a normal distribution, um, we can use what's called the 68.95.99.7 rule. Now, this is something that we actually saw in uh, Algebra 2. And it is a good estimate. It does not get us a lot of what we need, but it can be useful. So for the 68.95.99.7 rule, what that says is that within one standard deviation of the mean, that would be going one standard deviation each direction, we get 68% of the data. If we wanted to go two standard deviations from the mean, we get 95% of the data. And three standard deviations from the mean, we get 99.7% of the data. Which means if we wanted to find, say, what was from the halfway over to this one, that would be half of 68. That would be just 34%. If we wanted to find what was between 1 and 2, well, that wouldn't be half of 95. We'd have to go 95 minus 68 and then divide by 2. 
So 95 minus 68 is 27. And then divide by 2 gets us 13.5. So 13.5% would be in between 1 and 2 standard deviations. Um, if we wanted between 0 and 2, we could add these two things together. So 34 plus 13.5 is going to be 47.5% would be right there. Um, if we wanted something above, let's say we wanted... Uh, change my color. Let's say we wanted everything above 2. Well, we know that in between 2 is 95. So that means on the outside of 2 is going to be 5. We only want half of that. So we'd have 2.5% would be outside. And not from 2 to 3, but from 2 all the way out to infinity. I mean, granted, once we get a little ways out, there's not going to be anything there, but it still keeps going. Um, and so that is what the 95, the 68, 95, 99.7 rule does. It breaks it up with each standard deviation. Now, it's pretty close. It is not exact, but it, it's close enough for the estimates. Um, so we could have our problem with the SAT again. We have a mean of 1059 and a standard deviation of 210. So we could label this. The mean, it's not zero, it's 1059. One standard deviation, we're just going to add 210 to get 1269. Add another 210 for two would be 1479. Another 210 would be 1689, but we know that's not going to happen, right? Because it actually does cut off at 1600. But for this, we'll just we'll, we'll go with it. Um, going the other direction, 1059 minus 210 will be 849. Minus 210 will be 639. Minus 210 will be 429. And so we could see things like, um, what's the probability of getting above a 12, we want the probability of X being greater than a 1269. Well, we know that in between there is going to be 68, so that means outside is going to be 100 minus 68 because the whole thing's 100%. So that'll be 32% outside, which we only want the top half of it. So we can divide 32 by 2 to get the probability is 16%. Would be above the probability of getting above a 1269. We could look at the probability of getting between a 639 and a 1269. That's not quite the 68. It's also not quite the 95. It's, it's kind of a combination of both. If we break up the pieces into the chunks, we can actually just add chunks together. So we saw the 68 divided by 2 was... 34%. This is another 34%. We found this side uh, was 13.5%, which means this side was 13.5%. We found those. Um, we found those on that last slide where we went 95 minus 68, and we divided by two. Um, and so now to find this chunk. So the x is in between 639 and 1269. We can just add the 13.5 plus 34 plus 34. So that's 68 plus 13.5 is 81.5 percent. And so we could find all of these things. And we just have, we have, um, 
the numbers that aren't the standardized numbers on here. But notice I started out with the same standardized one. I just added the numbers we were working with uh, because that makes it easier to deal with the problem when we're actually seeing the numbers that we're looking at. So um, the problem is, is that we're not always looking at individual standard deviations like one like what about that 1.2 standard deviations that we found earlier with our SAT score how are we going to deal with that well working with the normal model um, this is where we're going to get into tables so first of all we have three rules first three rules of working with a normal model first rule you've got to make a picture draw a picture normal distribution a lot of times on the ap test a picture is actually worth a point on those problems like that'll be the difference between a p and an e so you need to make a picture rule number two make a picture when you make a picture you're going to make sure that you get the right direction more often than not a picture is huge rule number three make a picture just in case you forgot the first two we have the third rule make sure you make a picture that is it really does help it saves you points um, in a number of different ways and it just helps you explain what you're doing in fact as we'll see when the table comes up here in a second there's a picture on the table like it's it, they're all over the place so let's go back to our SAT we know that X bar was 1059 and S was 210. And those are actually the population values um, because that was everybody that took the SAT in 2019. And so we could consider that the population. And you got a 1311. Why did you get a 1311? I don't know, I just picked a number. That, that was where the 1311 came from. And so, we want to see what what percentile did you get in? How did you do uh, compared to everyone else? Yeah, you got 1.2 standard deviations above the mean, but what does that mean? So we can find our z-score. Oh, that's the wrong color, and it didn't work. So we can find our z-score. It was the 1311 minus 1059 over 210 which was 1.2. We found that earlier. All right, now what do we do with that? We take it to the table. Now, this is sometimes, it's the Z table. This is a lot of times called table A. And it, ha because it's the first table that any statistics class ever sees. And so that's why it gets table A. Um, there's actually a second part to it. It's almost always on two pages. This is a second page. The first page has all the negative values. So it's the negative Z's. Notice here, we start at 0.5 because when Z equals zero, we're at the mean. Half of it's above, half of it's below. It's symmetric, so the mean and the median are the same. Um, so the other half of the table just has negative values here and all of the numbers will be less than half. You can actually get away with only using half of the table if you do it correctly, um, but they're both there. They're generally face to face. So you see them both at the same time. Sometimes they're back to back depending on the pages. Um, you get this table for the AP test along with of several other tables that we will use. Um, you do not need to memorize the table. Um, you just need to know how to use the table. And so how do we use the table? We're looking for the Z value because that's what we have. We have Z equals 1.2. So the column, this column is Z. It's the whole number and the first decimal place. And then we go this way to get the second decimal place. So we have 1.20. So we look down to the 1.2 and then that first column is going to be zero. 
which is 0.8849. I know it's pretty small. I wanted to get the whole table on here instead of just like a little chunk of the table, just so you could see it. Um, I get this probably small, especially if you're looking at this on your phone. Um, the table's in your book. This is just straight out of the back of the book. Um, anyway, so the probability of um, x being, come on pen, x being less than 1311 is going to be 0.8849, which means if we're looking at percentiles, you're in the 88.49 percentile. You did better than 88 and a half of all the other people that took this test. Um, and so that's what it is. Um, I know a question that a lot of times comes up. I've been using a lot of less than signs. What if I went less than or equal to? X is less than or equal to 13.11. Does not change it. The probability, being that the probability is the area under the curve, the probability of it being at exactly 13.11 11 is zero. It's all ranges. So the or equal to sign does not make a difference. You can have it, you cannot have it, doesn't matter. Um, so let's do another one. Let's say instead of instead of getting a 1311, let's say you got a 1500. You want to know how'd you do there? So, same idea, z equals 1500 minus 1059 over 210. So we can run this calculation. And we get 2.1. I was hoping it was going to be a, which is 2.10. I picked 1500 just randomly thinking like, it's got to have another decimal point. What are the chances it's going to be just a point something zero? Well, got it. So we go 2.10 to get 0.9821. So the probability that X is less than or equal to 1500 is 0.9821 which means if you get that 1500, I mean, it puts you in the top 2%, in fact, even less than 2% of all the people taking it. Um, and so that's how to find it. Now, what if we wanted the, what's the probability of it being between those two numbers? Well, in that first one, oh yeah, see here's that drawing. So in that first one, we had our probability at 1300. We'll just say it's here. And that got us this. So this was the, or 1311. And then the second one at 1500 got us this. Well, how would we figure out what that probability between them is? We would do the big one, the blue one, minus the little one, the red one. So we would have 0.9821 minus 0 0.8849, 0.9821 minus 0 0.8849 to get 0 0.0972. So the probability of getting in between those two values is 0 0.0972. So notice what I did there. It was just subtraction. I subtracted, but notice I subtracted the values that we find in the table. We can subtract probabilities. You cannot subtract z-scores. That does not work. If we subtracted the z-scores to 10 minus 1.2, we would get uh, 
0.9, which is nowhere near that value that we just got. So you cannot subtract Z scores. You can subtract probabilities to find the area in between two values, kind of like what we did with the 689599.7 rule to get those things. Um, if we wanted to find, if we want to know the probability of getting above a 1500, we would just subtract. So the probability that X is greater than or greater than or equal to 1500 is going to be one minus this number 0.9821. So it'd be 0 0.0179. So that would put you in that top 1.79th percent. Um, and so that's how you'd find the above. The This table always gives you the probability below the number that you're doing, just like that drawing shows. So that's how to use the Z table going that way. What if we wanted to go backwards? What if we want to be in the top 10%? The top 10% of our um, uh, SAT scores. So we have our mean, we have our standard deviation. So we know that the equation is going to be Z equals X minus X bar over S. Well, we know this, we know this, we're looking for that we need to figure out what Z is. Well, we're going to go back to the table. This time, though, we're looking for that top 10%, which means what percent has to be less than that number, because that's what's in the table. So 90%. So we need to figure out where is 90% in the table. So we're looking at the number of values and we see right here we go from 0.8997 to 0.9015 so those are really both close to 90% um, I think that the 0.8997 is closer um, but not by much so you could use either or really there, depending on if you want to be overly cautious or not. You could also go point, you could use like the point zero zero five right in the middle of them if you really wanted to. Um, it does not make much of a difference. Uh, the the actual like numerical difference is going to be minor. And one of the things that they tell you at the end of the chapter in the, the cautions is don't worry about those little tiny differences because the different computer software like they round to different places and stuff it's that's not that big of a deal we're going to we'll use the this one because it's closer so we can get the z value from that the z value is 1.28 so the z is 1.28 so we can now plug that into the equation we have 1.28 equals x minus 1059 over 210. First thing we need to do is we need to multiply that 210 over, and then we're going to add the 1059. It's like this is the extent of the solving equations that we do in statistics, really. Um, so we have the 1.28 times 210, which is 268.8, then plus 1059 gives us x would have to equal 1327.8. So it equal 1327.8 would get you into that 90th percentile to get that top 10%. Are you going to get a 1327.8? No, you are not. So you would need a 1328 because a 1327 is going to get you not quite the top 10, that'll be like the top 10.01%, 10 
but that's not what you're looking for. So you need that 1328 to be in the top 10%. So that's how we can use the table backwards. Um, it, you just find the Z value based on the probability, use that to find the Z value. And then from there, plug into the equation, multiply by the standard deviation and add the mean. Um, and I will show you how to do this stuff on the calculator as well. Um, I'll show that to you in class. Uh, it's nice to do it by hand, but sometimes the calculator can help out. So it can be handy. Um, and speaking of calculator helping out, a uh, normal probability plot. What is a normal probability plot? A normal probability plot is a graph that we use to help to check to see if something's normal. It's called assessing the normality. Again, statistics has all sorts of fun words and phrases. We get to assess the normality of something. Um, and so what a normal probability plot is, um, first of all, you will never graph one by hand. I'm going to show you how to graph it using the calculator. And what it does though, or what it is, is it looks kind of like this. So we have a histogram here, it's on its side. The normal probability plot is this one. In order for it to be roughly normal, we are looking for this to be linear or roughly linear. This one's roughly linear with most of the dots close together, like in the middle, and then they get a little bit more spread out on the ends. This one, we can see it like kind of drops down there. It's not quite linear. And we can see that, oh, hey, look, those two points over there. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, it's still close enough. This is not clearly non-normal. We could, we could treat this data, we could treat the distribution as a normal distribution. Um, an example of one that's not um, normal, like this one we can see is clearly skewed that direction. And then look, it's not, it's not particularly linear. Um, notice most of the dots are still kind of grouped up in the center and then it's a few dots out, but it's not, it's not linear. So this one looking at the normal probability plot, I look at that and say like, no, this is not support the distribution being normal. And so we wouldn't be using a standardized value because of standardized values, those Z scores do really require that it is approximately normal. Approximately is another great word. Like you never, ever, ever call a distribution normal. It's approximately normal or not clearly non-normal. Um, and so um, that's, that's our normal distributions. That's our z-scores. We are going to be building on this a lot um, with just different little, very, very, very minor tweaks here and there for different things. Um, but this is going to be used a ton. Um, so you're going to want to get familiar with it. And again, I will show you how to do some of this stuff using the calculator in class. And until then, though, don't forget to read the book. Keep working problems, keep asking questions, and as always, happy mathing.